welcome to our short video on the context and performance of Greek tragedy. So in this, we're going to get in our time machine, we're going to travel back, sit ourselves down in an ancient Greek theatre and have a look around. See what was around us, see what was involved in the staging, see what kinds of people were on stage and what they were up to. So let's begin with when and where. So we are setting our time machine for 5th century BC Athens. Now we could go back further in time, we could go back into the 6th century BC and consider where tragedy came from, or we could move forward in time and think about how tragedy developed over time. But we are going to concentrate on the 5th century as this was the high point for Greek tragedy. And it was during this period that the three great and luxuriously bearded tragedians were composing their tragedies. So our tragedians are Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. The 5th century BC Athens is just ludicrously broad. So let's see if we can narrow this down a little and think where and when in particular. So we are first of all going to imagine ourselves sitting in the theatre of Dionysus on the southeastern slope of the Acropolis in Athens. And this is what you have in the image here. This is our theatre of Dionysus. And you can make out some of the seating here going back into the hillside. And we have our orchestra here. Now what we are looking at are the remains from a 4th century BC renovation. So it wouldn't have looked quite like this in the 5th century, but it does give you a general idea. And I've specifically given you this image just so you can see modern Athens in the background and this nice interaction between the old and the new. So a few things I want you to keep in mind and to take away from this image. So first of all, the fact that you are outside. So this is a completely different atmosphere to what we might think of for a theatre. So we are outside, you know, basking in the glorious sunshine and possibly in great heat if we are very lucky. And secondly, that you have this huge amount of people in the audience. So even from this kind of small amount that's left, you can see how many people would have actually been able to sit in this kind of tiered seating here. So you are talking about thousands of spectators, which again is not what we expect today in the modern theatre. And just to highlight this change in our modern perception of theatre and how the Greeks would have enjoyed it, Sophocles Oedipus the King, it was first staged in the early to mid 420s BC in the theatre of Dionysus, so on the slope of the Acropolis, outdoors, surrounded by thousands of people. And then a few years back in 2015, the Abbey, the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, it staged its version of the Oedipus, so a version by Wayne Jordan, where it moved indoors very much. And we had an audience of about 700 people, I think the Abbey can seat. So tragedies, they are on stage a lot still today, lots of different versions of them but we ourselves view them in a very different context. So we're brought inside and the audience and also the makeup of the audience is very different than what the Greeks would have known. So we now have a very specific location. We are in the theater of Dionysus. And the reason we are there is the city Dionysia. So this is our specific when. So many tragedies are performed during the city Dionysia, which was a festival dedicated to Dionysus, so the god of wine and revelry and theatre. And you can see quite a typical image of Dionysus here with his drinking cup holding onto his vines. So our city Dionysia, it was a five day festival held in about late March in Athens. And this was a state occasion, so businesses, for example, would close so that everybody could go. There was a massive crowd at this particular festival and lots of things were happening during it. You had, for example, a parade of war orphans. There were processions, sacrifices and libations, so liquid offerings. But very importantly for us, there was a three day tragedy competition and a one day comedy competition. And I do want you to take note of that word competition, because this is really very important. So the tragedies that you are reading, 
they were written as part of a competition. They were written to win. And it's really quite interesting to think about the tragedies in that way and to question what would have appealed to the audience and the judges and maybe what wouldn't have appealed to them. In terms of the competition, every year three tragedians were chosen and each had to compose three tragedies and one satyr play. In terms of the tragedies, these could be connected in a trilogy or they could be stand alone plays. So considering the tragedies you might have come across, Aeschylus Prometheus Bound was part of a trilogy and both Sophocles Oedipus and Euripides Medea were stand alone tragedies. And each of the tragedians had one day of the competition to put their various different plays on stage. And at the end of this, the winner was decided by the vote of 10 judges. So generally with one person taken from each of the 10 tribes of Athens and Attica. So in terms of the three tragedies we have here, we don't know where Aeschylus came that year. Uh, the year that Sophocles presented his Oedipus, he came second in the competition. And the year Euripides presented his Medea, he came third, i.e. last in the competition. During this three day competition, what can you expect to see in the theatre? And one thing that you're just about guaranteed to encounter is a story or a myth that you already know. So most of our tragedies were based on very well known myths. But the thing is that the tragedians, they were very free to innovate. They were free to change some well known myth, either in a very subtle way or in a more dramatic way. So even though the audience might know the story of Oedipus, for example, or of Medea, they won't be entirely certain how Euripides or how Sophocles, for example, are going to change that story of, or which aspect of the myth they are going to concentrate on. So much like today, if someone were to adapt a book for a film, they might change the ending, for example, or put more emphasis on a particular character than you find in the book. So they can alter it subtly or more dramatically to play with the audience's expectations and to give them something new. And it can be quite fun to put yourself into the mind of the tragedian and to pick some really well-known myth like the Oedipus myth and think what you would change if you were going to put this on stage. So would you change just one really small thing that might have a bigger impact or might you go for something far more dramatic? So it's quite interesting to put yourself into the mind of the tragedy and, and it also gives you a greater idea perhaps of what the audience, what they would expect when they were looking at these tragedies, um, this playing out of stories that they already knew on stage. And this use of myth, it does feed into kind of an overarching rule for Greek tragedy, which was not here, not now, not us. So our tragedians, they could talk about anything they wanted really, but there was safety in talking about contemporary issues, for example, by using the distance of mythology. So placing these events into the mythical past with figures who were not in Athens, who were not Athenian males. So there was safety in this. So dealing with contemporary issues, but placing them in this far safer situation of mythology. So let's take a minute now to look around us. So we're currently seated in the Theatron. So let's say we're, we're right slap in the middle there and we have a good vantage point for everything. You will see directly in front of you, you have the orchestra. So this is where our chorus would be. And then here we have our skene, our backdrop. So we're going to look at the three of these in a bit of detail, our Theatron with our audience, our orchestra and our skene. And here you have your parados, so you have an entrance at either side as well. So our actors or our chorus could come on through the parados at either side. So let's begin with the audience in the Theatron. And from your imagined seat, take a good look around you. As we dealt with earlier, this is not the theatre as we know it today, or in fact the audience that we would expect today. There are thousands of people here all ready to kind of join in the glorious spectacle of the tragedies. And there were lots of different people in the audience, both from within and outside of Athens. And most of our information on the makeup of the audience comes actually from comedies. 
Because in comedies, the actors would break what we call the fourth wall. So they would speak to the audience and they would mention different groups, for example, young boys and older men. So this is something that tragedy did not do. But if you want to settle on a majority group in the audience, it was male citizens. And this means that this was the group for which tragedies were primarily written. So like with the competition angle, this offers another really interesting way of thinking about the tragedies. What were the tragedies saying to this particular group of people? And in general, our audience as a whole, they play this really important role in tragedy in that they all agreed to suspend their disbelief and give themselves over to the tragedy, which is something we still do today. And as we're going to see, tragedy was not very realistic or naturalistic. So you needed the audience to just be on side and to agree that they will believe this person wearing the mask is Medea or that this person is Oedipus. Moving then from the spectators to the performers, we first meet the actors. And our tragedians, they face certain limitations or perhaps more accurately, what we would consider limitations with regard to actors. They could have at most three speaking actors and some tragedies can actually be performed with only two. The actors were male and they wore masks and robes. And you might be quite relieved to hear that in this image, the figures are holding masks, so theatre masks and not some terrible severed heads. So you can see just how much detail went into them. So you have the hair and the beard and um, they're quite clearly of a certain age. So a lot of work went into these masks. Originally, the tragedians themselves, so the composers of the tragedies, would have acted in the tragedies, but later they employed actors. And because of the limited number, one actor could play numerous different roles in a given tragedy. And it is quite fun to sit down with a tragedy and kind of take note of entrances and exits and which characters are on stage at the same time. And you can figure out from there which characters might have been played by the same actor. So it's quite a fun thing to do. So working our way forward, we come to the orchestra, the sometimes circular, sometimes semicircular space where the chorus performed. And the chorus consisted of 12 or 15 people and they were funded by private citizens. And our chorus, they both sang and they danced. In fact, the, the word chorus comes from the Greek word for to dance. So we would today probably consider it more with music than anything else, but it does come from our word for to dance. And the chorus was musically accompanied in their dancing, in their singing by an aulus player which was a double pipe instrument that you can see in the image here. The role of the chorus was really quite extensive and, and very interesting in that they are both part of the tragedy, but also interpreters or observers of the tragedy. So they have this really interesting dual role all of the time. So to, to look in more detail at just a few aspects of their role, and the, the, all of these may not apply to every tragedy that you might be working on in your course. So our first possibility for a role of the course is that they explain the place in the action. So remember our tragedies are usually well-known myths or stories, but they need to explain to the audience what part of the myth this particular tragedy is concentrating on, what time in the action we are coming into the story of what innovations may have been introduced. So they very much point out to the audience that this is where we are beginning. This is what is happening in our version of this particular myth. Number two, the chorus can engage in exchanges with the actors. So they did not solely sing on their own in these great choral odes. They did have interactions and exchanges with the actors. So this would progress the particular story in the tragedy. Number three, the chorus can comment on the action and themes and offer opinions. And it's in this way that the chorus play the role of the spectator and the commentator engaging with what is happening on stage very much from this almost outsider perspective and in some ways then mirroring the response of the audience. 
So they're looking at what's happening on stage from this external perspective while still being part of it. So they're commenting on various different themes and actions happening on stage. Number four, the chorus can play a really very practical role in allowing time for the actors to enter and exit and change their costumes to move between their different roles. So remember, we have that limited amount of actors. They need to switch between roles so you can have the, the chorus step forward to offer this time for them to change their mask, change their robe, etc. Their songs can mark a break in the action. So this is number five. And then number six, they can offer some relief between quite intense scenes. So as you will have noticed in the tragedy, you know, there are some really dramatic and quite um, emotionally intense scenes. And so the chorus, when they break in with a song, for example, they can kind of take away some of that tension. So it's not quite so difficult to, to take the entire tragedy. Moving behind the orchestra, we meet the skene, from which we get the English word scene. The skene was the building that was used both as the backdrop for the play and as a place for actors to change their costumes so when they were going between different roles. Originally, the skene would have been made of wood, and for this reason, they don't survive today, these original ones. And Sophocles is said to have invented skenographica, so that is painting the skene to make it appear to be a certain building, for example. The roof of the skene could also be used by actors, for example, an actor playing a god, so that they could seem to appear on high. And one interesting use of the skene was as a place for violence. A lot of violent things happen in tragedy, as I'm sure you have spotted, but you might be quite surprised to learn that they don't happen on stage. Rather, they are reported as happening elsewhere, or they happen within the skene and the audience can hear some aspects of the violence. Uh, take, for example, Medea's children pleading for their lives within the Skene, so that's what the audience can hear. And there are some different reasons that violence may have happened solely off stage, perhaps relating to religious aspects or to the tastes of the audience, but one issue was surely the difficulties of staging some of the gorier scenes in tragedy, so take, for example, the scene in Euripides' Medea, when Glauke is ensnared by Medea's poison robe and diadem. So I'm just going to read through this now. And as I am reading through this, I want you to think how you could effectively stage this scene. So whether in the ancient world or today. So when I'm going through it, just think about how you could actually present this to the audience. The golden circlet about her head shot forth a terrible stream of consuming fire, and the fine spun gown, gift of your son, was eating into the wretched girl's white flesh. And all aflame, she leapt from the chair and fled, tossing her hair this way and that, trying to shake off the diadem. But the gold crown held its fastenings firmly, and when she shook her hair, the fire only blazed up twice as high. She fell to the floor, overwhelmed by disaster, barely recognisable to any but her father. Her eyes no longer kept their wanted form, nor did her shapely face. And from the top of her head, blood dripped, mingled with fire, and her flesh dropped from her bones like resin from a pine torch, torn by the unseen jaws of the, of the poison, a dreadful sight to behold. So I'm guessing that you didn't really come up with any way to effectively stage this that would match the horror of what is conveyed in these words. So you could never match on stage what this conjures up in the spectator's mind. So there is a great use of the spectator's imagination in tragedy. So by placing violence off stage or in the skene and then reporting it afterwards, it allows the audience to really engage with it and to create their own imagery of what it looked like. And it means that the tragedians, they don't need to find a way of placing this on stage because how could you do it? There is no way you could effectively convey this. So with the flesh running down her face and all of these very, very gory scenes, so there is much emphasis on the audience and their imagination. 
So we're going to end our short journey through the staging and context of tragedy with two quirks of the Greek theatre. And the first is the Echiclema. So this is a low platform which could have been wheeled out through the central door of the Skene to present interior scenes to the audience. Often scenes of the outcome of violence that has happened inside. So when this happens, the audience really had to suspend their disbelief. So something we mentioned before, they had to as a body agree that whatever was on that Echoclaima, they were going to accept as being an interior scene, that they were looking inside at this particular thing. And the Echoclaima was not a very naturalistic thing. Uh, this little uh, wheeled device, you can just imagine it squeaking out through um, the door. And for this, it was mocked in Greek comedy. So it's one of those um, quirks of Greek tragedy that makes it even more lovable and interesting. And finally then, we meet the amazing Mekene, the crane-like device which hoisted an actor above the skene and allowed them to seem to float, so to float uh, in front of the audience. And this was generally something that was reserved for the gods, especially when they appeared at the end of a tragedy to tie up all of the loose ends. And when this happened, it was known as the deus ex machina, so the god from the machine, so when this god appeared. But interestingly, the earliest attested use of the Mekina was in Euripides' Medea, when it was used not for a god, but for the mortal Medea. And you can see her in this image here, in her grandfather Helios' chariot, um, drawn by snakes here. And this really opens up some very interesting avenues of thought concerning Medea and her status at the end of the tragedy. So we have to question if by this placement on the Mekina, Euripides is in some way saying that she is now more than mortal. So through her terrible act of killing her children, has she somehow reached a different level? So she may not be quite divine, but she does seem to be more than mortal. And with that thought, and with Medea high in the air and on her way to Athens, we will end our short time-travelling visit to the ancient Greek theatre, so I hope you enjoyed it.